Welcome to our first Calculus 1 lecture. And today our lecture is going to be on the concept of limits. And so before we get started uh, doing anything formal with limits, let's just talk a little bit about how limits work, what they look like, and maybe why do we even need a limit? What are limits all about to start with? So to start out, I just want to draw you a graph. So start with a little graph right here. And uh, my x-axis in this case is going to be time. And uh, my y-axis is going to be distance. And uh, I used to live in Spokane, Washington. And so I'm going to say that distance 0 here, this is where, so this is y equals 0. And this is Spokane. And then up here, uh, some distance away from Spokane, I used to have to drive all the time uh, from Spokane to Salem. And so here's Salem. And it just so happens that Salem is almost exactly 400 miles away from Spokane. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw my trip on this uh, T and D axis. So uh, as time went by, I traveled. I started in Spokane, and time is zero, and I made some trip. Okay. Um, so after drawing this trip uh, from Spokane to Salem, and as you can see, I come back again because eventually I'm back in Spokane again. Uh, let's look at some of the things that I can see just by looking at this graph. Uh, the first thing that you might notice is that something interesting is happening right here. Right here, I, time is increasing, but my distance isn't moving at all. And so you might say, wait, for, at this point, you weren't moving or you weren't moving very fast. And maybe that's because right here, let's say I was going very fast. You can see that here my spe speed was quite high. So maybe here is where I got pulled over and got a ticket uh, or maybe I was stopping for lunch. Who knows? But you can see right here that time is moving, but distance is not. And so somehow I stopped right here. So here I was going quite fast because my, uh, as time went by, my distance changed quite a bit. Here it did not change much at all. Uh, then I started going faster and faster again, eventually getting to Spokane, I, I'm sorry, to Salem. And then I turned right back around again and headed back to Spokane. What happened here, maybe something fell out on the road. I realized it here, turned around, came back, and then quickly uh, made my way back to Spokane. So this is giving you some idea of what my trip looked like. Just by looking at the graph for a little while, you can get a feel for it. The big things that I see and the thing that I want you to notice is that we can tell something about my trip based on the slope of the graph. In fact, the slope on this graph tells me about my speed. Okay. Uh, when there's a slope of zero right here, I'm moving zero miles per hour. When I've got a very steep positive slope, I'm going quite fast towards Salem. When I have a very steep negative slope, I'm going quite fast towards Spokane. So we can see things from slope. Okay, that said, this is kind of setting up for us why do we care about limits or what is a limit? Well, what if I were to ask you, uh, let's take a point, let's say it's right here, and I say, what was my speed at this particular point? Maybe we call this point A. And I said, at time A, what was my speed? Well, if you just take the functional value of A, you get my position right, my distance away from Spokane. That would be f of a. I want something different. I want the slope at a. 
uh, the slope, well, it might look something like this dotted line. So I've got some slope right there. So how do I find the slope? Well, if you think back to when we learned algebra, pre-calculus, things, uh, classes like this, the way that you calculate slope is you find a line and maybe figure out what's the slope of that line. Uh, so if I see I've got this line right here, and we typically call that line the tangent line, then I could just say, well, what's the slope of that line? Well, there's just one problem, and that is that to find a line or to find the slope of a line, we know you need to have two points on the line. You can't just have one. If you just have one point, I know nothing. If I have two points, then I can calculate the slope between those two points, and I'm good to go. So we're in an interesting situation here where I want to know the slope, but I only have one point on the line. So what do we do? Well, this is kind of a preview of things to come, but I think it's worth talking about right now because we need to learn a little bit about why do we care about limits? Why do limits matter and what are these things called limits? So let me show you something really quick just so you can see. So I'm going to blow up this piece of the graph real quick and just look at it. So this piece of the graph just kind of looks like this. And I'm saying what is the slope of this curve at a point A. Well, I said to find slope, I really need to know two points on some line. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, let's say that I move up a little bit and say that this is another point. And I draw a line through those two points. Now, first of all, that's not the tangent line. Okay, That's not the tangent line to the curve. The tangent line looks more like this. All right, there's my tangent line, the dotted line. This is some new line that I'm getting with A and A plus a little more. Maybe we'll call it A plus H. And so what I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, I need two points to make a line. So here's another point. Let's use it to make my line. Well, it's the wrong line. Uh, but is it close to being the right line? And maybe, uh, depending on where I put this point, you might say, well, it's not very close. Or maybe you say, yeah, that's pretty close. Either way, it's an estimate. And I do know a way that I could make the estimate better. And the way that I would make the estimate better is let's move H closer, or A plus H, closer to A. If I did, I could take a new point here, uh, on this curve and draw a line through the new point and it's very close to my tangent line. It's not exact, but it's very close. If I took a point even closer, it would give me something even closer. Now, what if I let H get very small? Or in other words, what if I let H get close to zero? If H is zero, then I don't have two points. If h is very, very close to zero, I do have two points and I know how to calculate a slope. So there's something about this letting things get small, but not completely be zero. If it was zero, it's nonsense. I don't know anything. I can't compute anything. If it's very small, but not zero, then I can compute a slope. And so the question is, well, what if H was zero? Can I compute that? No, ultimately I cannot. But I could make H get very, very close to zero and then predict what it would be if it was zero. That is the concept that we call a limit. Okay, limits are let's let something approach zero, in this case zero, and see what it looks like it should be if H is zero. So I can predict that tangent line based on these other lines that I create by looking at A plus H. Okay, that's why we need limits. We need limits for ideas like this, where uh, I'm trying to find maybe an instantaneous velocity on a curve. I want to know exactly at that time what was 
the velocity. I can't do that by traditional algebraic methods. I need to take an estimate and let that estimate get extremely close to the actual value. That is what we call a limit. That's why we need limits. We need limits so we can find these like instantaneous velocities. Okay, that gives you a little bit of a feel for where we're headed here. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit more about limits. Now let's look at an example. Let's look at the function f of x is equal to x divided by x squared minus x. And first I'd like to kind of debunk a common mistake that calculus students can make. And let me show you. Uh, let's look at this function uh, x divided by x squared minus x. And here's the question. Is this true or is this not true? Uh, is this the same thing as 1 over x minus 1? Are those the same function or are they different functions? Okay. Uh, and you can see down here, I could factor out an x, correct? So I could write this side as x over x times x minus 1. And then you might say, well, come on. Uh, this thing factors. So I've got an x divided by x here. Just cancel the x's and you get this guy. And so they're the same thing. Well, it's not quite true. Okay, so this is not true. Those are not equal to each other. And the reason why is because x could be zero, okay? If x is equal to zero, then these are not the same thing. If x is not equal to zero, everything's fine, and they actually are the same thing. So it just depends on, are you allowing for the fact that x could be zero or not? If x could be zero, not the same. If it is not zero and you know it, then they are the same. Okay. Let's keep that in mind as we do uh, the next step of this process. And I ask this question. What is the limit as x goes to 0 of x over x squared minus x? Well, something that would be nice to know here is what does this function actually look like? Okay. Uh, if you want to know what this guy looks like, let's graph it real quick. Um, so here is the point 1. And um, this guy is going to look pretty much like this. And my question is, what happens as x gets close to zero? Now, as x gets close to zero, what limit as x goes to zero is saying is, I don't care what happens at the point zero. If I plug in zero, what happens here? If I plug in zero for x here, I get zero divided by zero, which is absolute nonsense, right? We know that zero divided by zero is undefined. We don't say that the answer to a limit is ever 0 over 0. If you ever get that as your answer, 0 over 0, you know right off the bat that you're wrong. Uh, you did something wrong. So if we're looking at this guy, um, then I want to look at this function as x gets close to 0. So if x is close to 0, then I'm talking about points that are very near zero, but aren't actually zero. What happens if I plug in zero? I get zero over zero. So there actually is no functional value here at zero. There's a hole in that graph right at zero. All right? So as I get close to zero, though, th this does seem to be getting close to a number. And I want to know what is the number that it's getting close to. OK. So the way that I might look at this is I might plug in some values for x and see what comes out 
of this function f of x. So if I plugged in some values, uh, I'll plug in some, let's see, uh, how about I could plug in something like 1 half, I could plug in something like 1 fourth, 1 eighth, plug those in to the function here and see what you get. I'm going to leave that for you to do. Plug in these values in for x. You can pause if you want to right now. Plug it in. See what you get. And, uh, and see if you it feels like the f of x values are getting close to something. The graph gives us some intuition about what we should expect. So as we go to 1 half, we go to 1 fourth, we go to 1 eighth, what are the functional values doing? They're getting close to some value. What is that value? Well, it ends up that that value is negative 1. And as we go from the other side, if I plugged in negative 1 half, negative 1 fourth, negative 1 eighth, again, take a second, pause the screen, plug in these values, see what we get for our f values. When you do, you'll see that the numbers are getting closer and closer again to negative 1. So we would say that this limit equals negative 1. So this is one way that I can go about figuring out what a limit value is, is just plug in x values that are very close to the number I'm approaching. In this case, I'm approaching 0. So I want to plug in some values for x that are close to 0 on both sides. What I'm really doing is I'm saying as the x values get close to 0 from both sides, if I like draw some arrows on this guy, am I pointing at something? Is there a value that from the left side and the right side I'm pointing at? And we're talking about not an x value because I know x is going to 0. I'm talking about a y value that's being pointed at. And the answer in this case is yes, and that y value right here is negative 1. That's the limit I'm going for here. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody, that the concept of a limit is I don't care what's happening at 0. That's a big deal. That's a huge deal when you're talking about limits. I don't care what is actually happening at 0. I care what's happening near 0. So if I want to know what's the limit as x goes to 0, I'm interested in what happens at 0.1 and 0.01 and 0.001. As I get really, really close to 0, what are the y values of this function getting really, really close to, if anything? And if they are getting close to something, that's what we call the limit of that function. All right, now let's take a look at another example. Uh, here I have three different functions. Uh, here's a function f of x, here's a function g of x, and here is another function h of x. You'll notice they all look very similar, except at the point x equals 1. Notice it on this first graph, at x equals 1, I have a hole in the graph. Here, at x equals 1, I have some functional value. In fact, the functional value is 2. Over here, I have a hole in the graph, but I actually do have a functional value of 1, and that's 1. Over here, notice there's no functional value of 1 at all. So let me ask a couple questions right off the bat, just so we get it right. Uh, what is, in this case, what's f of 1? Well, f of 1 would say, what's the functional value over 1? And in this case, it doesn't exist at all. So this uh, does not exist. Okay? Over here, what's g of 1? Well, g of 1 is this point right here, which is 2. So g of 1 is 2. And then finally, let's move over here. What is h? Of one. Well, h of 1 is this dot that lives right over 1, and that's at y value 1. 
So here we've got f of 1 doesn't exist. Here we've got g of 1 is 2. Here h of 1 is 1. Now let's look at the limit values of those points. What's the limit as x goes to 1 of this function f of x? Now I'm asking a completely different question. Now I'm asking the question, as the x values get close to 1, what are the y values getting close to? In other words, as I approach 1 from the right and from the left, what are the y values getting close to? In other words, it's kind of like if I covered up 1 and I didn't show you at all what was happening at 1, what would be your guess as to what the functional value of 1 is? Just based on the rest of the function. So based on the rest of the function, you'd say, oh, the functional value should be 2 if you were blind to what was actually happening at 1. That's what a limit is. It's saying, based on the information around me, what should the functional value be, not what is the functional value. So if I just look at the points around 1, it looks like the functional value should be 2. Over here, what's the limit? as x goes to 1 of g of x. Well, same thing. If I cover it up and you just guess based on the rest of the function, it looks like from the right side, I'm getting close to something. From the left side, I'm getting close to some y value. And what y value are we getting close to? 2. It doesn't matter what happens at the point itself. So this limit is 2. Similar over here, the limit as x goes to 1 of h of x is, well, from the right it looks like it's going to 2, from the left it looks like it's going to 2, so this is 2. So all three of these functions have exactly the same limits as x goes to 1, but they all have different functional values. So the functional value could not exist, it could be the same as the limit, or it could be something totally different from the limit. And the whole point of this example is, hey, it absolutely does not connect. Limits and functional values, different things. Don't ever confuse the two as being the same. A functional value is what is the point right over that x value. A functional value is saying predict what it should be based on the numbers that are close. And so there's no relationship between functional values and limit values. And that's really important going forward. All right, now let's talk about two very simple limits that we can just see graphically how they work and we can just say this is what the limit is. First, let's look at the limit as x approaches c of some number c, okay? Um, and so what we have here is it's just a constant. And in fact, it doesn't have to be the same as this constant. Let's just make it any old constant. So I'll just make it k. Uh, if you wanted to, you could say... Uh, well, k could be 3, k could be 7, k could be pi. It's just some number, okay? And c is also just some number. So if I were to look at this on a graph, y equals k, here's k, is just some horizontal line. And what I'm asking is, well, at c, what is the function getting close to as I come in from the right and I come in from the left? Is it getting close to some y value? And you might think, well, that seems fairly obvious. Yes, it is. It's getting close to this y value, which is k. That's correct. So the limit as x goes to a constant of k equals k. <coughs> It doesn't really matter what the c is. It doesn't really matter what the k is. If they're both constants, this ends up being the constant k. The way that we say this in general is we just say that the limit of a constant 
the limit of any constant is just that constant. The limit of a constant is the constant. Okay? So that's the first very simple limit that we can just see graphically. Let's talk about this limit now. The limit is x goes to c of x. Well, the function y equals x, we know what that looks like. It's just a nice diagonal line like this. And what I'm saying is, okay, let's say that there's a number c out here, and I'm getting close to c from the right and the left. As I get close in this direction, and I get close in this direction, I am getting close to some y value. What is that y value? Well, based on the nature of how this line works, that value is also c. Okay, so the limit as x goes to c of x just happens to be c. So as I approach some constant value c on the function y equals x, I just get the value c out. All right, so these are two really important limits for us to know, that the limit of a constant is always that constant, and the limit as x goes to c of x is always c. All right, let's talk for just a second about why a function might not have a limit. Okay, we've been talking about, about a few functions that do have limits. Uh, let's talk about some functions that don't have limits at a point. And specifically, I'm going to talk about some functions that don't have limits at zero. Okay, so let's look at this first guy. This guy doesn't have a limit at zero, and let me show you why. Uh, it jumps at zero. Okay, so anytime that a limp, uh, function is moving along and then it jumps up real quick and keeps going, at the jump point, it doesn't have a limit. Okay, so the first reason that some, a function might not have a limit is because of a jump on the function. All right, at the jump point, we don't have a limit. What about over here? Here, there's kind of like a jump of sorts also, but it's a different type. This function is moving along, and it just shoots up to infinity. And then on the other side of zero, it comes out of infinity, where at zero, it's not defined at all. So this thing kind of like goes off to infinity, and so it doesn't have a limit at zero, because on either side of zero, it's going to either positive or negative infinity. So I'm just going to say that this one goes to infinity. So that's the second reason you might not have a limit at a point. And the third one, this is, uh, we don't see this one quite as much, but it certainly could happen. And that is, it just kind of, the function keeps bouncing up and down, and it bounces up and down infinitely many times as it gets close to zero. So this is, this guy awesome. Okay. So a function that oscillates uh, also doesn't have a limit because it bounces up and down infinitely many times as it's getting close to zero. So it's not really getting close to anything as it goes to zero. Or you might say it's getting close to a lot of things. Either way, not so good for taking a limit. So these are kind of the three ways that a function might not have a limit at a point, is if it jumps, if it goes to infinity, or if it oscillates. All right, now let's talk about an important theorem that has to do with limits, and that is the limit laws. Um, let's read this together, and then I'll talk a little bit about it and maybe give you some examples how this works out. Um, so the limit law says if L, M, C, and K are all real numbers, and the limit as X goes to C of F of X is L, and the limit as X goes to C of G of X is M, then we get all these rules. Okay, so let's go through them one at a time. They're actually pretty straightforward. Uh, they make a lot of sense. The first one is the sum rule, and that is if you have the limit as X goes to C of F of X plus G of X, then that's just L plus M. In other words, I can distribute a limit across the sum. So I could take the limit of F of X, which is L, and I could take the limit of G of X, which is M. So I can distribute that limit. 
Okay. The second one is the difference rule. That if I have the limit of this x goes to c as f of x minus g of x, then again I can distribute that limit over that difference. So it's the limit of f of x, which is l, minus the limit of g of x, which is m. Okay. Third, I have the product rule. So if I have the limit of a product of two functions, so the limit is x goes to c of f of x times g of x, then I can take the limit of the first guy, and the limit of f of x is l, and I can take the limit of the second guy, the limit of g of x is m, and so I can just take the limit of the first times the limit of the second. Okay. Again, I can distribute over a product, so the product rule. Constant multiple rule says if I have the limit as x goes to c of a constant k times a function, then it's just k times the limit of f of x. In other words, I can move that k outside of the limit and then take the limit. So constants move through limit signs. k can move outside of that limit, and then I can just take the limit of that f of x. Okay? Quotient rule says if I have the limit of a quotient, in other words, the limit as x goes to c of f of x over g of x, then I can take the limit of the top divided by the limit of the bottom. The limit of f of x is l, the limit of g of x is m, and that works as long as you're not getting division by zero. In other words, m can't be zero. If m is zero, that doesn't quite work out. Okay? And then finally, we have the power rule. And the power rule says, let's look at the limit as x goes to c of f of x raised to the power k. And what the power rule says is, I can just take the limit of f of x first and get l and then raise it to k. So limits can move in and outside of powers. Okay, so if something's raised to a power, then I can take the limit of the inside and then raise it to the power. And that's what we call the power rule. So these are my rules of limits. And using these rules, we can do all sorts of cool things. And so uh, let me show you an example of how this kind of works out. All right. Here's an example. And we want to use our limit rules that I still have lifted, uh, listed over here on the right side of the board to help us to figure out this limit. And so the first thing that I see is that I have a difference, and I also have a sum. Uh, and I know that limits distribute over differences and sums. So I'm going to use both the sum rule and the difference rule. If you like, think of this as one function and the two as another. So I can break up my limit over using the sum rule, and then I can break up my limit using the difference rule, and I get the following, that this is the limit is x goes to 2 of x cubed minus the limit as x goes to 2 of 7x plus the limit as x goes to 2 of 2. I just use the sum rule and the difference rule. But now I have the limit as x goes to 2 of something cubed. And I said by the power rule that this is the limit is x goes to 2 of x quantity cubed, because limits can move inside of powers. Okay, S similar here, I've got a constant multiple times x. So that constant multiple, I know I can move out because of the constant multiple rule. So let's move that 7 out, and I get minus 7 times the limit as x goes to 2 of x. And then finally, I have plus the limit as x goes to 2 of 2. Now let's remind ourselves of those two basic limits that I covered earlier in the video. If you don't remember, go back and look real quick. Uh, what were the basic limits? It was the limit as x goes to a constant of x, and the limit as x goes to a constant of a constant. And the limit as x goes to 2 of x we uh, discovered earlier, that's 2. So I just get 2 cubed. Here, the limit as x goes to 2 of x, that's just 2. So I get minus 7 times 2. 
And here, the limit as x goes to 2 of 2, the limit of a constant is always just this constant. So that's plus 2. So what's the answer here? I get 8 minus 14 plus 2, which is 8 minus 14, negative 6 plus 2 minus 4. So the limit in this case is minus 4. Now what if I see, why is this kind of like, well, you might be asking yourself right now, uh, why did you do all that work? Couldn't you have just right at the beginning said, if I plug in 2, I get 8 minus 14 plus 2, which is negative 4? And the answer is, uh, yeah, I could in this case. Okay, so this is a special case where I can just plug in the number and get the answer. But it's very important to remember that limits are not just plugging in the number. In this case, I could have plugged in the number, and it would have given me the right answer. That's not always true. So this is an interesting question is, when is it true? And when is it not true? And when it is true, that's kind of special. This is a special case. And in fact, any polynomial that I would have put into this spot and taken the limit, I could have just plugged in the value. For polynomials, I can just plug things in. And actually, for rational functions, I can just plug things in as well because of these limit laws. So polynomials and rational functions are kind of special. Now, rational functions, you have to be a little bit careful because in a rational function, you have a quotient, and the bottom could be zero. When it's zero, that's special, and you can't take the limit that way by just plugging it in. But as long as the bottom doesn't give you division by zero, then you can. Okay? So let's write those two things down in our notes real quick, just to make sure that we've got it. All right. Here are two important theorems for us, then. First theorem, limits of a polynomial can be found by substitution. So if you're taking the limit of a polynomial, you can just plug that x value in and you get the limit. Similar for rational functions. And remember, a rational function is just a polynomial that's divided by another polynomial. Limits of rational functions can also be found by substitution with one exception, and that is, well, what if the limit of the denominator is uh, if it's zero on the bottom, then you can't do it by substitution. But as long as you get something other than zero on the bottom, you can just go ahead and plug it in. Okay, so polynomials and rational functions are kind of these special functions where you can just plug it in. In fact, in many cases with many of the functions that we work with in calculus, you can plug it in unless you're creating something illegal, like division by zero, or uh, taking the square root of a negative number, or something like that. As long as everything works out, you can typically plug it in because of all these nice limit rules that we get to use. Okay? So uh, it's not just polynomial function and rational functions where this work. It's any combination of polynomials and rational functions that use these rules. So in general, a good rule of thumb is if you can plug it in and everything works out nicely, that's great. If you can't, that's where it gets kind of interesting. And we can still take limits in that case, but we have to do a little bit more work. All right, one more thing to talk to you about, and then I think I'm ready to turn you loose with a few example problems and some homework. Uh, so after this lecture, make sure and watch the example problems that I do, and then you should be ready for some homework and get in there and work with some limits. Okay, I want to talk about right-hand and left-hand limits. And in some ways, we've already talked about it, but we really have hidden and, and so let me show you what I mean here. Uh, let's say I have a function, and it looks something like this. Then not only, uh, let, let me call this the point A, and let's call this the function f of x. Um, let me draw this a little cleaner here. 
Okay, so uh, it's perfectly, and let's say that this is the point now. It's perfectly okay for me to ask a question like the following. What is the limit as x goes to uh, a of f of x? And when I ask this question, I'm saying, as the x values get close to a, what's the limit? Uh, and we've been working with this for a while now. I'm looking at this graph. We say, as I get closer and closer to a from the right and left, what are we getting close to at a y value? And the answer here is L. But I could ask it in some other ways, too, that this is a little bit different question. So now I'm going to put a little plus sign right here. Okay? And what that little plus sign says is, what if I'm only approaching A from the right side? Okay, the plus means right. And the way I like to think about it is, what if I'm approaching it from, like, positive land? Where, on the graph, where is, like, positive infinity? Where are the positive numbers? They're over here. So as I come in from this direction and get close to A, so as I'm getting closer and closer to A from positive land, then what y value is the function getting close to? And in this case, the answer is, well, it's getting close to L. I could also ask what's the limit as x goes to A from the left. Or as I come at A from negative land, is that, or the left side, as I get closer and closer, what y value am I getting close to? Well, in this case, the answer is still L. So everything's the same. And you might say, this seems kind of silly. They're all the same thing. And what it's not so silly. It's just that this is a special case where the right-hand limit and the left-hand limit are the same number. When they are the same number, then I can say that the function has a limit, and that limit is the number L. Okay, I could easily draw an example of a function, and let's do it really quick, where this is not the case. Okay, so here's a quick example. Let's say I have the following. So here's my point A. We'll call this L. We'll call this N. And now let's answer these same questions. Let's start with what is the limit as x goes to a from the right of f of x? So if this is my function f of x, if I come in from the right, remember the right side or the positive side, as I come into it from the positive side, what are the y values getting close to? Well, they're getting close to m. And uh, what are they getting close to as we come in from the left? Well, they're getting close to L. So the limit from the right side, as we come in from the right, is M. As we come in from the left side, we're getting close to L. And so they're not equal, which means that this limit does not exist. For it to exist, it has to have a right-hand limit, it has to have a left-hand limit, and those two numbers need to be the same. In this case, there is a right-hand limit, M, there is a left-hand limit, L, but they're not the same number, so there is no actual limit at that point, which should not be shocking at all to us, because this function has a jump at A, so it doesn't have a limit at A. Okay? So right-hand limits and left-hand li limits are very similar to limits. You're just looking at one side instead of looking at both sides.